Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the National Museum of the American Indian, and welcome also to our webcast audience. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Gish, and I manage the seminars and symposia program here at the museum. Um, we're delighted to present today's uh, program, Chocolate Chat, as part of the museum's Living Earth Festival, which is an annual event and a wonderful one. Uh, our topic today is a very engaging and interesting one, and we have some fine speakers that I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, before we begin the program, if you have a cell phone with you, please turn it off or silence it so it doesn't disturb the program. Thanks very much. Um, it's my great pleasure now to introduce um, Chef Sue McWilliams, who will moderate today's program. Chef McWilliams has 30 years experience teaching and as a professional chef. Um, she's trained in Italian cuisine, um, and her repertoire evolved into global fare, and recently um, focused on indigenous North and South American foods and technique. Her study of culinary history has brought her insight into cultural foodways and the provenance of ingredients, including chocolate. Um, she's a member of the Women Chefs and Restaurateurs Organization and serves as program director for Washington, D.C. Um, McWilliams has cooked for the Living Earth Festival here, and she served as a judge in the Native American Chef Cook-Off, which is a lot of fun. Um, her teaching includes serving as director of a public high school uh, culinary arts and restaurant management program certified by the American Culinary Federation. And she also has operated a culinary skills job training program for women in addiction recovery. Um, we are honored to have Sue with us. Let's give a warm welcome to Sue McWilliams. Thank you. Welcome, Sue. Good afternoon. Uh, we are taking a brief survey today and we wanted to know how many people here like chocolate. Oh, that works out. We didn't get all hands, though. <laughs> OK, well, today the four of us are going to share a story with you. It's about something we're each very passionate about, the origins of chocolate or cacao. Our intriguing story begins in Mesoamerica about 4,000 years ago. Uh, in a small valley in what is now the Yucatan, the Maya cultivated the earliest known cacao plantations. The cacao plant thrived, and the seed of a cacao tree grows off the trunk and creates large pods, which when ripe, hold beans embedded in a white pulp. We will hear in detail the process of harvesting and making chocolate later during our chat. As far back as uh, 1800 BCE, the people of the region had learned to prepare the beans of the native cacao tree. Some of the earliest records tell us about the Maya people grinding beans and mixing it with cornmeal and chili peppers to create a warm drink. This drink was very different from what we think of the flavor of hot chocolate today. Uh, it was a bitter, invigorating concoction frothing with foam. They also believed that cacao was a heavenly food given to them by a feathered serpent god known to the Maya as Kukulkan. The pods symbolized life and fertility. This, was, this reverence for cacao in their culture was included in the most sacred rituals, birth, marriage, and death. Vessels were created for their special drink from hollowed out gourds, often etched with the Maya glyph uh, or symbol for chocolate. Other ceramic vessels illustrate elaborate scenes. Traces of the chemical stimulant found in cacao, theobromine, have confirmed their use. Cacao beans played an essential role as currency in the Maya culture. Cacao originally meant carrying over from those who work or cultivate, which could be interpreted as exchanging or paying. During the first century, Maya territory stretched from the Yucatan Peninsula to the Pacific coast of Guatemala, 
moving from Central America to the northern portions of South America. They developed complex writing and mathematical systems and a very impressive calendar based on a solar year and a sacred almanac. So next, the Aztec civilization emerges in the 1200s. Flourishing in the Valley of Mexico, Aztec warriors were skillful and aggressive, allowing them to conquer neighboring people. Those who were high up in government, royalty and military were very wealthy and it showed in ostentatious ways. They expanded trade routes and marketed corn, jade, gold, and cacao. The Aztecs didn't actually cultivate cacao. All of the areas they conquered that grew cacao were ordered to pay a tribute or a tax by supplying cacao beans. Cacao beans continued to be used as a form of payment. One, one bean could get you a tamale, three beans of fresh turkey, and a hundred beans would hire a porter for the day. They too believed the cacao bean had magical and divine properties, and offerings were made to the god of wisdom, Quetzalcoatl, daily. Again, the cacao drink, still unsweetened, was served at royal feasts, but at this point, records show it was no longer served hot. Cacao was given to Aztec soldiers as a reward or payment. Uh, by 1400, the Aztec Empire took over a sizable part of Mesoamerica. So now this brings us to a place in history where the Spanish and the Portuguese are exploring the world by ship. Columbus visits the Central American Atlantic coast and returns to Spain with a few cacao beans, but nothing comes of it. The Spanish think they are some kind of almond. Uh, the first transatlantic chocolate encounter occurred in 1519 when Hernan Cortez arrives in the Aztec capital looking for gold. He and his soldiers are served the cacao drink in impressive cups of solid gold. The Spanish conquistadors record their encounter and describe the drink as something that keeps you awake all day. Within three years, Cortez and the Spanish rule Mexico and Spanish colonialism spreads. This ends the pre-Columbian era in the Americas and the effects of the Columbian exchange is felt by all indigenous people in the Americas. The Spanish bring disease, smallpox, yellow fever, malaria, and it spreads in a devastating way, wiping out millions of people. They also bring cattle, cows, cheese, pork, rice, and sugar. You see here, uh, there is trade to Europe of potatoes, tomatoes, squash, coffee, corn, and cacao. This absolutely changes the way the world eats. So, oops, this is my next slide, sorry. Uh, the cocoa drink doesn't go further than Spain for about 100 years, and it is used to treat various ailments. The Spanish monks were the first to sweeten it, and immediately trade routes spread uh, throughout Europe over the next century, where it was enjoyed by royal courts and nobility. At first, chocolate was thought to be so decadent and sinful, it is frowned upon by the church. And it's written that Pope Pius V finally allowed the consumption in order to please the wealthy and devoted followers who would sit in services for a long time. Uh, the world of chocolate changes again in the early 1800s when several inventions across Europe make chocolate production more into the product that we know today. But the in invention of the steam engine mechanized the grinding process Conching is invented and creates a means of heating and rolling the chocolate to refine it. 
secret techniques in blending and roasting the beans, family recipes, and creative interpretations are in and innovative candy making techniques are handed down through the centuries, making chocolate a respected commodity. Industrialization brought chocolate to the masses, yet it is still considered to be an exceptional indulgence. So, with honor and reverence, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. First is Julio Saki, who is here all the way from Belize, and this is his hometown here on the slide. <laughs> uh, he grows and produces organic cacao and coffee. He is also a chef and master chocolatier. He and his wife, Heliodora, operate the Maya Museum and Coxcomb Tours. They're deeply committed to promoting the Maya culture and the indigenous sustainability of what they grow. Uh, next on our panel is Chef Freddy Bitsoe. He is the executive chef here at the museum and uh, uh, is a winner of the Living Earth Native Chef Competition in 2013. He brings a unique perspective to our talk today with his background in cultural anthropology and art history, uh, in addition to his incredible palette. And there at the end of the table, we have Neftali Duran, who I first met when he competed and won the Native Chef competition three years ago. His Oaxacan roots have played into his life as a chef and a baker, along with his community leadership, ensuring food access and policy change to create a healthy environment and a more equitable food system. <clears throat> 